Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Lord's Day. Today we start a new study and we're going to do a few chapters of Revelation. We're going to cover the seven letters to the seven churches. It's important because we need to hear what God has to say to the churches, which applies to today as well, on how to live, the things that please God, the things that don't please God, and also how to be an overcomer. So we're going to do a few chapters of Revelation, but I'm also going to do the beginning in Revelation 1 and the throne room. So you just get a picture of the glorified Christ, and because that just adds so much more to it. But before we start, let's say a word of prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, we honor you today, and we come here, Lord, asking for your your mercy and your grace, Lord, for our nation, for our world, <laughs> Lord, for, for the virus. Lord, I just ask you, Lord, to intervene for us. We lift up our churches, Lord, that they will have a heart for you, Lord, and that you will, this will be a year where we'll see a great move of God. I ask for the, the harvest, Lord, which is white unto harvest, that you will send out laborers. And Lord, we will see a great move of God and a stirring of your people. Speak to us through revelation that we will learn how to be overcomers. And Lord, just open, your, open our hearts and open our minds, our ears, and our eyes to see you and hear you clearly. Lord, I lift up all the prayer requests that are on people's hearts, those that have recently lost loved ones. I lift up the Maza family. I lift up Mike, Medlin, and Pam and their family, Lord. I lift up others that have lost loved ones. And I lift up those who are sick and those who are struggling and those with financial needs and uh, relationship needs, Lord. But you know the needs people have, and you know what burdens they carry, and I lift them up to you in the name of Jesus. Now speak to us through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, today we're going into Revelation. I just felt particularly led to go into this chapter, and uh, we're going to start with the beginning. But Revelation actually means to reveal or to unveil. It's like God took John and, and he allowed the curtain to be pulled back to see what is to come and see the things that he wants them to write. And he told him to write it down for our purposes. So this is a revealing or an unveiling of God and his majesty and his glory and the things to come. So chapter one of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ or the revealing of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. He said, I gave it to someone who was an eyewitness, someone who had the testimony, knew the word of God and knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I wanted him to reveal this and to show people the glorified Christ. And you know, it's interesting, it says, these things will come to pass shortly, or he comes quickly. And you know, in this life, it, it appears it's getting closer and closer. And even back then, when Jesus wrote it, you know, about coming quickly, it was to all audiences, including us. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which were written in it, for the time is near. So here we're talking about there is a blessing promised. I don't know about you, but I want a blessing for those who read, but not just read, those who hear it and listen, and those who keep the words of this prophecy. I want to read you the end of Revelation 2 because there's some other warnings in here about this prophecy. And I'm going to start in Revelation 22, beginning in verse 18. This is John speaking. And I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. And then he testifies, surely I'm coming quickly. Be ready, because he's coming quickly. But this is a warning. We're not to take anything away from or add to the Word of God. 
That's why it's so important that we read the whole Word of God. And it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's all the Word of God. So we need to know those things. But let's go ahead and go on. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John. To the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn among the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. He says a lot of things here, but first he's talking to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And I'm going to show you a picture. This is a good picture showing you where these seven churches are and where a lot of the ministry took place. John and a lot of the ministry began in Ephesus. You can see Ephesus right here. Actually, Patmos is down here where John is. But these seven churches, and if you look in the order that they're written to, he writes to them kind of in an order. He, he writes to Ephesus, Smyrna, then Pergamum, Tyre, Tyre, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. They're all in a general region. And the way this, these churches started was basically they were mission churches planted probably from Ephesus, which was the home church. And that's probably where John was ministering when he was exiled to Patmos, which we're going to cover in a second. But uh, Colossae's right in here, but he had seven particular letters that he wrote, which are really a message to the church today as well. But I just wanted you to get a picture of where these seven churches are. Okay, going on. Grace to you and peace from he who is to come and from the seven spirits who are in the throne. Oh, let me go back. Okay. And peace from him who is, who was, and is to come. You know, we have to understand that God's been in the beginning. Jesus has been in the beginning with God. And in the triune God existed at the very beginning, the Spirit, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And He always has been. He is the one who, who was, He's the one who is currently, and He's the one to come. He's, he's always been. He's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. And then it says, and the seven spirits who are from the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Make no mistake about it. He's still on his throne, and he's king of kings and lord of lords, and he always will be. And all power and authority is given unto him in heaven and earth. But it says here he's faithful. You can bank on it. And he is true. But the seven spirits that are before the throne, and I, I put a verse here for you. And basically, it's, it's a, Isaiah 11.2 mentions seven characteristics of the Spirit of God. The first is the Spirit itself. The Spirit, and it, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So the, the seven spirits are also speaking, but it's one spirit with these seven attributes that are all encompassed in the triune God. So it's talking about the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of life, uh, the, the promise of the Father. But it also says he in Him and in Christ and in God the Father dwells these attributes of the Spirit. You have the Spirit of wisdom. He has wisdom. He not, he not only knows what to do, He knows the right thing to do at the right time. He has wisdom and he has understanding. He understands things. He knows things. You know, he, he's always been from the beginning of time. And he knows all this stuff. And then the spirit of counsel. He's called a great, the counselor, the wonderful counselor. And because he, he knows how to counsel. He knows how to help us. He's available 24 hours a day to pray to. He is our great counsel and might. He is all powerful. All power and authority is given unto him. He is, he's got all strength and all power. He is our refuge in a time of trouble. So we serve an almighty God, omnipotent, all powerful. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The spirit of knowledge, knowing all things. 
knowing things to come as well as things that are. And, and also because he was the one who was and is and is to come. But also the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is a spiritual attribute to show us the respect and awe for a holy God, for who he truly is that we may understand. And that's one of the reasons I chose to read chapter one and not just go into the seven letters because <clears throat> we need to understand who he is. And we need to understand all these attributes are tied in for everything he knows, the fear of God, to understand God and, and have an awe for a holy God. And then moving on, it says, to him who loved us, he loved us. God is love. It's not that we loved him first, but that he loved us. Love is the greatest character that flows into every other attribute God has. <laughs> and, and love drove everything Jesus did. His, his, he had such great faith and did such great miracles because they were driven by love, by the love of God. He loved us and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. He paid the price to wash our sins and, and to pay the debt that we could. He, he, he died so we would have forgiveness of sin and shed his blood. And he has made us kings and priests to his God and kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He will always have glory. He'll always have dominion. And it says he's made us kings and priests. Well, you're part of a royal family if you're a child of God. <laughs> you're, you're part of the royalist family, the highest, the highest that you can be. And so we are kings in that regard. We're kings of the kingdom. We're children of God and we're part of royalty and that doesn't change. You know, it doesn't matter where you come from, what level of life you are, what country, what language. We're all royalty <laughs> because of who God is. And when he accepts us, he accepts us into royalty. But we're also priests. We're a royal, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. We're all called to be ministers. To be ministers, we're equipped for the working of the equipping of the saints. So we can, we can help others and we can minister to others and share the word of God and show them the Savior. So it says, and to the priest, to the God, the Father, to him be glory and forever and ever. Behold, he is coming in the clouds. And every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. That's prophesied in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, that they will look on the one they pierced on the cross. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. They will mourn because of him. And I, I wrote a scripture here, Matthew 24, 30. And it says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. For they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They will mourn. It talks about, this is, this is in the Matthew 24, but in Revelation, it talks to them wanting to hide in the caves from the one who is coming because they fear God. And, and the wrath that is to come and they want to be hidden and they ask for the rocks to fall on them. I mean, there'll be people who will look on the one they pierced and they will mourn for a couple of reasons. First, it mentions he was pierced. So his wounds are evident. And they'll, they'll mourn because they missed the one who paid their price. And they missed the one who paid their debt. But also because the one that they, that they should have followed is now coming. <laughs> And you don't want to miss your time of visitation. Don't mourn at the time of Christ's coming. But, but we need to be ready and make sure we're ready. This is so important. And then he closes with this when he's talking to John. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. <laughs> he is God Almighty in addition to be the one who is, who was, and who is to come. But it says he's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning of all things, the end of all things. He's the first and last. He's the beginning and the end. God started everything and God's going to end everything. So we need to understand who, is, who he is. But we're going to go in to this part about the vision of the Son of Man. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation 
and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I showed you on the map, Patmos is off, off the island. Patmos is a small uninhabited island that's about six miles by 10 miles, 10 miles long by six miles wide. Not a very big island, it's very rocky. Um, the only people that would be there are people that were exiled, they're prisoners there. So they, they uh, persecuted John by putting him on this island where he couldn't minister to the people without a boat. And so he's, he's on this island. And I wanted you to see this because he said he is put there and he's being persecuted for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ because he was faithful to teach the truth. He is being persecuted. And if they persecuted them, they'll persecute us. And we need to be ready. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. But it also says he was there and he's a companion in tribulation. And that's not the worst that he went through. He was, tr he was persecuted many other times. But he's a companion in their suffering as well as the ministry as a brother and sister of Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard a voice behind me, a loud voice as of a trumpet. So he was in the spirit of the Lord's day. I love this. He's on the island by himself and God says, good, I got you where I need you. I need you to have some private time just with me because you've got a book to write <laughs> and you've got a vision to see. But, you know, I can't think of a better thing to do on the Lord's day than be in the spirit. <laughs> he was in the spirit of the Lord's day. He will be with you and shall be in you. He was filled with the spirit. He felt the presence of God all over him <laughs> and God came upon him. But you know, when we go on the, especially on the Lord's day, he truly worshiped on the Lord's day, but he couldn't go to church, but he worshiped because of the presence of God. And he had an encounter with the Holy God. See, God is with you even if you're persecuted and put in exile on another island. God knows where you are and you can still worship. It says that he will set a table before you in the presence of his enemies. He will, you can still feast with God in spite of your circumstances. But it says, and he heard behind him a loud voice of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So these are the seven churches. So he's given an instruction, but he heard a voice like a trumpet. Now, why a trumpet? You know, it says uh, um, that, that God, uh, God will call people with the voice of an archangel and the sound of a trumpet. He will call his elect from the four corners of the earth and they will rise and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive will be caught up in the air. But the trumpet's also used by Gideon to sound the alarm to sound the, the calling of God's host, a host from Almighty God. When God uses the sound of the trumpet, he means be alert, be ready. This is important. This is so important because it's about fulfilling the will of God. <laughs> and he says, I need you to do something. He says, I want you to write this in a book. I need you to record what I'm going to tell you. And he says, and to send it to these seven churches. I need you to send them a letter. And so God's given him specific instructions to write it down. I'm so glad, and I know you are too, that he instructed many of the prophets and the, and the, the people that wrote the word of God and John and Peter and Paul and all those who wrote the word. He instructed them to write in Jeremiah because so that we could have it. That's the reason he wanted it written because it is written. <laughs> And God wanted him to write it. So he heard the sound of the trumpet. And he's told to write these, these letters to the seven churches, which I just showed you. Then I turned to see the voice who spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. He's called the Son of Man. He's also called the Son of God. But I want you to understand there's reasons for both of those. He's son of man because he represents man to God. He took our place. He's our hero. <laughs> he's the one that died for us. He represented man to make us right with God. But he's also the son of God. He's the one that 
represents God to us. He's both. He's deity, but he's also human. And he's the one who came in human flesh to show us the Father and to be able to connect us to God. <laughs> and so here we have the one like the Son of Man, the one who represents us, the one who was our advocate with the Father, the one who died for us, that brings us to God, the Son of Man in the midst of the seven lampstands. The seven lampstands. Clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about with a about the chest with a golden band. You know, the, these, this vision of the glorified Christ, clothed with a long robe. It says, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash. That's like priestly garments. But a long robe, it usually means a person of great dignity and authority. Priestly garments. So he was a person of great dignity and integrity and, 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 and in great importance, and also a person with great authority, with this golden band, it was like a priestly garment. But that's important because you have to understand why is he in the midst of these seven lampstands? We're told at the end of this chapter, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The lampstands. You remember the golden lampstand we studied in Exodus and how the, he would, the priest would enter into the holy place and they would minister and trim the wicks and they would... They would they would uh, make sure there was oil in the lamps and the light, the, and they were all lit and they were constantly burned in the presence of God. And there were seven branches. Well, these are lampstands representing each one, the seven churches. But one thing you have to understand, the reason he's in the midst is because he's the one tending the, church, the churches. He's the one trimming the wicks. He's the one adding the oil. He's the one that is helping us minister to the churches. He's the priest that enter in and he's watching the work of the church and he's observing. And he's the one that's taking care of the churches because he's in the midst in priestly garments. And then it says, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His hair was white like wool, white as snow. It also that is a reminder of his timelessness. He's the ancient of days. He's from the beginning of time. You know, it's a sign of wisdom. The white hair is a sign of wisdom. He always has been, always will be. In the beginning was God. <laughs> and in the beginning, God created. But it, it, it talks about this, this white as wool, white as snow is like purity and holiness. But it also represents wisdom. He has great wisdom. And so his hair represents the ancient of days who has come to share with us. This vision of the glorified Christ is a, is a magnificent vision of his character and who he truly is. Daniel 7, 9 says, I watched till thrones were in place and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow and his hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. This is the vision Daniel had of the throne. And he saw the same picture they see in the New Testament. It's an amazing thing that 40 different authors over 40 different times in many different years separating. And the people didn't even know each other, but they pinned the book that was written by the same author and they refer to each other. And they're the same in the Old and the New Testament. I wanted to show you that so you would understand that. But he shows his wisdom and his holiness and his purity. Eyes like a flame of fire. Inside, you can look in people's eyes and you can, it says the, the, the soul, you can see through the eyes. People's eyes reveal a lot. And, and you can see compassion, you can see caring, you can see sometimes how they're feeling and what they're going through, hurt. But here it says, his eyes are like a flame of fire. They're very penetrating. It's, fire can also be a sign of judgment. But he sees everything. He sees right through us. He sees our thoughts. He sees our motives. He sees what we do. His, his eyes constantly go throughout, to and fro among the earth, seeing what's going on, because he knows and he sees. He, but he penetrates to the very heart. See, he sees not just what we do, he sees what's in our heart and how our heart relates to him. The eyes of a flame of fire. 
And then it says, His feet were like fine brass as it was refined in a furnace, and His voice like the sound of many waters. His feet like fine brass, refined in the furnace. <laughs> you know, there's an amazing story of how Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and Daniel were told that they were, they were put with a choice. You can live and bow down and worship the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and his image, or you can be thrown in the fiery furnace to your own death. And they said, well, we don't, we don't worship anyone but the true God. And they said, we believe God will deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship you. We ser serve the living God. Well, he heated the fiery furnace up seven times, threw them in the fiery furnace. And the only thing burned was their ropes and the things that, that bound them. And, and they didn't even smell like smoke, but there was a fourth in the furnace, one like the Son of God. <laughs> and the Son of God was in the furnace with them. What does that represent? That Jesus has been through the fire. He's been through the trials. He's been through the suffering. He paid our debt. They scourged him. They pierced his hands and his feet. He sweat drops of blood. He's been through the fire with us. He went into the fire with us. And he helps deliver us. And he, and he takes us out of the bondage. And he releases the bounds and the ropes that bind us. He sets us free and takes the shackles off. He's been through the fire so he can be our representative. He is the son of man that represents us. So he has these feet of fine brass, and brass is a sign of judgment. Also, that represents the brazen or the brass altar. He paid the price. <laughs> he paid the judgment price. The feet, burnished bronze. Then it says, he's like a voice of the sound of many waters. The sound of many waters. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls or Horseshoe Falls on the Canadian side, you, you know that deafening sound or you come up to a great waterfall and you hear it. But even the ocean and the sounds of the ocean, they can be very calming. But his voice is like the sound of many waters. It's very powerful. It's majestic. It is, it is, it is, it is something that is overwhelming. And that's the way his voice is. And many waters, all together, he can be the voice of many languages just like that and speak to all of us at the same time. It's an incredible thing. He's the voice of many waters. Then it says, He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. <laughs> well, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And it, it talks about he has these seven stars, which we're told are the angels and the messengers for these seven churches. God's got them in his hand. He's got them in his right hand, his right hand of power. They get their power from him. <laughs> the authority for the church, he is the head of the church, and he is the one that, that all report to. And, and, and we are a church of the living God. <laughs> we serve God, and we have to understand it's God's church, but he's got the leaders in his hand. He's got the pastors and the ministers and the messengers in his hand, and he's carrying them, <laughs> and he's got the power. He has a sharp two-edged sword. This is the offensive weapon. He's going to use it at Armageddon too. The word of God is a weapon that he uses from his mouth. It is powerful. I'm going to read you Hebrews 4.12, very famous passage you're very familiar with. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit of the joints and the marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <laughs> the Word of God is alive. It's, it's, it's living. The Holy Spirit wrote it, and it's the only book that will talk back to you. It is alive, and it's powerful. It's so powerful that His Word is like a sharp two-edged sword. It cuts both ways, and He knows how to do precise surgery and go right to your heart and even see a crack He can hit. He's got good aim. <laughs> As David, if he has good aim with a slingshot to, with Goliath, he's got good aim, but it's very powerful. The Word of God, it says, he is able to take the Word of God and get between the bones and the marrow into your innermost being. He's able to get 
between your thoughts and intents of your heart. He's able to pierce that area of your mind and he's able to find the, the division between the soul and the spirit. You talk about powerful. He's able to know where the division is. Can you, <laughs> there's nobody can x-ray or anything that can show you where the soul and the spirit is, but he can get between them. He knows how to minister to your soul. He knows how to minister to your spirit and to you physically. The word of God is powerful. And all he's got to do is open his mouth. The word of, this is so powerful. This vision of God, his eyes. And it says, um, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. His countenance, the glory of God. It is so powerful. And we're going to see John's reaction. He's going to fall down like a dead man. Because if you ever tried to look in the sun in all its strength, uh, you wouldn't be able to look at it very long. In fact, you shouldn't look at it very long. But the glory of God is so powerful, it overwhelms everything else to where we can't even stand in the presence of God. That's why he said, no one can see my face and live because of the power of God. But look to what it says John happened. And when I saw him, when he saw this glorified Christ, he says, I fell at his feet as dead. <laughs> he said he just fell down as dead. And, and he, but then he says, he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid. How many times did Jesus say, peace be unto you? Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. <laughs> what a message. He tells him to get up. He gives him permission to get up because he fell down as dead. Now, when I see the way Ezekiel <laughs> and Isaiah and John reacted when they saw the glory of God, these are heroes of the faith. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about the, the top class. And, and yet they couldn't stand in the presence of God. How would anyone stand in God's presence and live? Except God allows it. <laughs> the holiness of God, the glory of God. But he told him, don't be afraid. And he said, I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives and was dead. I am the one who lives, but I was dead. But I'm alive. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. So be it. <laughs> I was dead, but now I'm alive. <laughs> and he's alive more than he ever was. He died for us, but now he's alive and he's highly exalted. God is highly exalted because he humbled himself even to the death of the cross for the joy that was set before him and for our deliverance. But this is great. <laughs> oh, and he took something else out. He says, oh yeah. He said, also, I've got the keys to the grave <laughs> and to death. I got the keys. <laughs> he got them. He's got the keys to your grave and he's got the keys to death. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ who gives us the victory <laughs> through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're more than conquerors through him. The grave cannot hold them. <laughs> he is the resurrection and life. He who believes in him, though we were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever dies and believes in him will never die. Why? Because he's got the keys. <laughs> he's going to open the grave. And he was first among those who raised from the dead. Now he closes the first chapter to John. Write these things which you have seen, and these things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Write the things that you see, the things that are, and the things that you will see that will come to, play, come to place later. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels or the messengers, their ministering spirits of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So we're told that the seven churches and the leaders or ministers are angels in charge of these churches. Next week we're going to be studying the seven churches. I'll be going over the the how they're set up and what God has to say. And then there's an overcoming statement with each one. But I had to start with this chapter. God bless you. 
and have a blessed week. And let's close. Thank you for the word of God, Lord. Bring glory to your name and thank you. Help us to see the power of, and the glory of God through this message and understand who you are. Thank you for dying for us and paying the debt and getting the keys to our grave and death. In Jesus' name, amen.